morning, everybody, and welcome to New Heights Baptist Church. We're glad to see everybody here today. If you would all stand with me and take your hymnals, turn to page 88. Page 88 in your hymnals, we'll sing all three verses. I sing the mighty power of God. So if, you're, if we're singing, I sing the mighty power of God, then you have to sing. All right, okay. You'll have to sing if the name of the song is I sing the mighty power of God. So everybody should be singing, amen? All right, everybody should be singing, amen? Everybody should be singing, amen? Okay, all right, all three verses on that first. I sing the mighty power of God that made the mountains rise, that spread the flowing seas abroad, and built the lofty skies. I sing the wisdom that ordained the sun to rule the day. The moon shines full. singing this morning. Please remain standing and take your Bible for our scripture reading. Yes, please join as we sing, as we uh, uh, read this morning from Psalm, book of Psalms 116, verses 1 through 4. Jesus tells me what my Father hath in store for every day, and though I tread a darksome path, he yields sunshine all the way. Psalm 116, verses 1 through 4, as we begin. I love the Lord, because he hath heard my voice and my supplications, because he hath inclined his ear unto me. Therefore will I call upon him as long as I live. The sorrows of death compass me, and the pains of hell get held upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then called I upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. Amen. Amen. I trust everybody in here today has called upon the Lord. Amen. Especially in salvation. Good to see everybody here today. Amen. Happy Father's Day, of which I have been one all, not all my life, most of my life. That would make Jennifer older than me. No. I've been a father most of my life, and I'm not about to stop now. Amen. I've got a good daughter. She took me up for a big old T-bone, I mean a ribeye steak last night. Amen. And that's a good daughter. Amen. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. Most of all, Father, we thank you for your love for us, your goodness and your mercies and your truth. Never lie to us, but always tell us the truth and how we might please you and be saved. We know, Father, through your Son, Jesus Christ, in no other way. Not through any man, not through any religion, not through any work, but only through Lord Jesus Christ can we have hope of eternal life. If we would call upon Him and receive Him as our personal Savior. And Father, we thank you for that. 
We thank you for these here today, especially our visitors. We pray, Lord, that you would make everybody here today hear your word by faith, that we might obey it by faith and bring you glory and honor, not only here through our worship, but especially through our service. <clears throat> Bless all those who cannot be with us here today, Father. Just give them grace and strength for the days ahead. We praise your name for helping two of our dear ladies this week, Sister Jimmy and Sister Brenda. Lord, through the surgeries that they went through, and now they're home, recuperating. And Lord, just continue to bless them and meet their needs, we pray. And bless their families as they minister to them. Most of all, Father, bless the preaching of your word here today. It's the most important part. Because through it, we hear you. Help us to understand what you're saying to us. And help us to live it by faith. And bring glory and honor upon you by doing so. For we ask in the blessed name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Go ahead and have a seat if you would, please. Choir, if you would, go ahead and have a seat. I keep waiting. I just told Tori, it's just one of these days I, f I felt like Brother Colt's going to step up here and say, Good morning, Vietnam! You know, just to see what you would do. Just to see what you do. He might not do that, but I would. So, <laughs> anyway, it's good to have you here uh, with us. I need to go ahead at this time and um, uh, put uh, Brother uh, Mike up uh, to you. I talked about him Wednesday, Wednesday night behind his back, so now I'll talk uh, right in front of his face. Uh -huh. And Mike, of course, when he got uh, saved just a week or so ago and uh, uh, asked if he wanted to be saved after service. He's been going through some difficulties in life. And, hey, that's this, this world. It'll give you a kick in the belly, you know. And asked if he'd like to be saved. like to be saved today. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And uh, Andrew, of course, a, a boy, they worked together there at the police department. And, and uh, I sent him back there in the office with him and led him to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, he was a little under the weather on Wednesday. We'd like to present him to the church for scriptural baptism this morning. Do I have a motion? Receive him, and we'll get taken care of this business. Brother James Carr is making the motion when the last you'll probably make in, in a few months anyway, with your uh, treatment and all uh, coming up. Get a second there. All in favor, say amen. amen. All right. Once you know the younger man beside him is his father. No, I'm kidding, you know. According to Brother Rick, that's the way things work out. I guess not. But anyway, it's really good to have you, sir. Thank you for being here and uh, honoring us and our Lord and your son. And we appreciate that so very much. All right, Mike, if you'll come follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. All right. <laughs>
Now that cross is our banner. Amen. Now if you would all stand with me, turn to page 335, 335 in your hymnals, we'll sing Love Lifted Me. I was sinking deep in sin, weren't we all? Page 335, we'll sing all three verses, all together on the first verse. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, from the waters lifted me, now say. some of these kids singing better than the whole rest of the group up here. Y'all got to sing it out on that second verse. All my heart. Here we go. All my heart to him I give, ever to him I cling. In his blessed presence sleep, ever his praise. Amen. Love so mighty and so true, merits my soul's best songs. Faithful seat right there and before we transition into our baptism I just want to say we need to have the kids in here more often because they bring smiles to y'all's faces when normally y'all just sing out there so y'all y'all are doing a great job okay I just want to say that so anyway now we're gonna have our baptism Get up there where everybody can see it. Troy says, Mike, and we're very proud of him and his decision to follow the Lord and be saved. And no, there's nothing like knowing if you die tomorrow, you're going to heaven and be with the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're so grateful for uh, Andrew inviting him to, uh, to church and in his decision to turn to the Lord and give his life uh, to the Lord. Amen. Mike, upon your public profession of faith and your obedience to follow the Lord, in scriptural baptism, baptism, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death. Bokini. Raised in the likeness of his resurrection. Brother, to walk with him the rest of your life. God bless you. Peace, 
Amen. What a blessing. What a blessing that is. And baptism, I always say uh, one word whenever we talk about baptism is it's identification. I'm identifying publicly with Christ so that everybody knows I have decided to follow Jesus. Amen. What a blessing. If you would stand with me again, turn to page 297. We'll sing Whosoever Surely Meaneth Thee. Page 297. We'll sing all three verses of this one as well. Page 297. I am happy today and the sun shines bright. The clouds have been rolled away. For the Savior is said whosoever Set free, his blood has made me whole. Whosoever surely meaneth me, surely meaneth me, oh, surely meaneth me. Whosoever surely meaneth me, whosoever meaneth me. Oh, what wonderful love, oh, what grace divine. Jesus should die for me. I was lost in sin for the world I find, but now I am set free. Amen. This all ever surely mean it me, surely mean it me, oh, surely mean it me. This all ever surely mean it me. be seated. At this time, the kids are going to come sing for us.
Amen. Amen. I love, uh, it's, it's the same thing that I get to see at camp is uh, whenever they're cheering and they clap along with the cheers and you can tell those kids that have absolutely no sense of timing. They're out there like, you know, just trying to cheer and everything. None of our, none of our teenagers, no, no, they. <laughs> That's a blessing. All right, if you would stand one last time and turn your hymnals, page 344. We'll sing the family of God, page 344. It starts with the chorus, so we'll sing the chorus, the first verse, and then the chorus again. Page 344. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by His blood. Join us with Jesus as we travel this side. For I'm part of the family, the family. bow and ask the Lord to bless us and bless the gifts of the church family. Lord of heaven, we do thank you so much for your goodness to us. We pray, Father, you'd bless us the day, the day, Lord, and we ask that this day we would certainly open our mouth wide to receive the everlasting word of God. So, Father, I pray that you'd watch over our church family, watch over the many needs. So, Lord, those who've had surgeries this week, Lord, we pray your healing hand upon them. And Father, I pray that you would bless uh, Brother Mike and you'd help him, Lord, without going in detail. He's had a, a tough hand uh, dealt to him, Lord. And I just pray that you'd use us to be a blessing to him and help him get through this and show him a much better way and with a much better people together as a church family. I pray that you'd help us to be a blessing to him and his family and his dad even. And Father, I pray that you'd bless our time together again and you'd bless our day. We ask it in Jesus' most holy name. Amen.
Well, if it uh, looks like on the way to church, walking to church, perhaps a little chihuahua dog found me on the sidewalk standing uh, still a little bit too long, it's because the, uh, the waders that we used back there, we used them this, this last week for practicing. And uh, Brother Daniel had them on. I wasn't going to tell you who that was, but that was Brother Daniel. And he bent down a little bit too low in practicing Brother Gabe and uh, the rest is history. And water went out and it didn't yet come out. Now it's out and in my left shoe. <laughs> if uh, you see Miss Tony Boyd, Miss uh, Hot-Blooded Tony Boyd, Cajun, crazy Cajun, you know. If you see her with her nose stuck up in there, it's not because she's stuck up. It's for the first time in years she's able to breathe. She had to prove it to me just earlier, so we thank the Lord for that, and that's, that's always good. All right, are you ready? Are you ready? Okay. Across America, according to 2022 data, indicates that there are approximately 18.3 million children who today are living without a father in their home. Understand that's about one out of four kids living without a daddy in the home. 80% of single parent homes are led by, of course, by the single mother. Children of single parent families are twice as likely to suffer from mental health and behavioral problems as those living with a mom and daddy. In one study, 70% of youth in state operated facilities, I'll let you fill in the missing pieces there, were from a single parent home. 70%. Children who are actively engaged, have a, have, with an actively engaged father, perform much better in school. They are 33% less likely to repeat a class and 43% more likely to get A's in school. In a study of 56 school shootings, we've got some officers here. Study of 56 school shootings, only 10 of those shooters, 18%, were raised in a home with both biological parents. 82% grew up in either an unstable family environment or grew up without a biological mom and dad. We got some problems. Not only has manhood been under attack for years, manhood. Uh, but now, of course, the biblical role of a father. There's no doubt that the performance of fathers has diminished over the years. And many seem to be perfectly content to give their body for a moment and then lack responsibility for years to come. Too many women have not helped the situation by presenting themselves as, as cheap hustlers. with a less than committed relationship as a husband or wife and then wonder why they are taken so lightly. Or as a man, any women will say amen? Present yourself as a cheap imitation, you'll get an uh, imitation response. Flypaper catches flies, not good men. That's all I'm going to get out of that? Cowards. <laughs> Very little, if anything, has had more damage on children in America than the destruction of manliness and fatherhood. These two roles, God ordained. God set the standard. The institutions of our land do not set that standard to be right. God set that standard. He ordained what males are to give, invest, perform, and what females are supposed to embrace. It seems to me, in some ways, we have torn the testosterone out of men and given it to girls. Further, we have given estrogen to our boys. Males are horrible imitations of females. Females are horrible imitations of males. Might I add, might I offer the predominant sexual orientation of the WNBA players as evidence? 
with some good light, of course, for women like Clark. Mr. Kipling, who was born in 1865 and died in 1936, he wrote this. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you, if you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, make no allowance for their doubting too. If you can wait and not be tired by waiting or being lied about, don't deal in lies, or being hated, don't give way to hating, yet don't look too good nor talk too wise. If you can dream and not make dreams your master, if you can think and not make thoughts your aim, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two impostors just the same, if you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken, twisted by halves to make a trap for fools, or watch the things you gave your life to broken and stoop and build them up with worn out tools. If you can make one heap of all your winnings and risk it on one turn of pitch and toss and lose and start again at your beginnings and never, never breathe a word about the loss. If you can force your heart and nerves in you to serve your turn long after they are gone and so hold on when there is nothing in you except the will which says to them, hold on. If you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue or walk with kings nor lose the common touch. If neither foes nor loving friends can hurt you, if all men count with you but none, too much. If you can feel the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distant run, yours is the earth and everything in it. And which is more, you'll be a man, my son. Being a man is much more than wearing a sports jersey shirt. It is much more than being fat. It is much more than growing a beard. There's a lot of guys in the stadiums who are males, but who are not men. Now God ordained the home, God ordained the home to have a functional father and mother working together as one. Working together as one, not two, but one. Male and female, the Bible says, he created them. And he told them to multiply. We've seen some of that lately. Keep up the good work. Adam and Eve, the first man and first woman, the first husband, the first wife. Ephesians 5, 28, So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. The Bible also says that a husband and wife, they are heirs together of the grace of life. Heirs together of the grace of life. Catch me there in 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3, I'll begin in verse 1. Likewise, ye wives... Be in subjection to your own husbands, not the other husbands, your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation, your life coupled with fear, whose adorning, now still talking about the women folk, not the men, we have to kind of clarify these things these days, Whose adorning, let it not be the outward adorning of plating, of plating of hair and the wearing of gold and or putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit which is in the sight of God a great price. For after this manner, reflecting on the prior verses, in the old time, the holy women, not just women, holy women also who trusted in God, adorned themselves being in subjection unto their own husbands. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him, say it out loud, Lord. Lord, whose daughters ye are as long as you do well, not in the outside of faith, inside of the faith, and are not afraid with any amazement. 
Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. All the way back to Genesis chapter 2 in verse 24, the structure that God has ordained is very, very clear. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. I don't think you need any flashcards for this one. Now let me stress this more. Go to Genesis chapter 5. When we get to Genesis 5, we see this even more pressing the point of this oneness between a husband and a wife. One man, one woman. This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him. Male and female created he them and blessed them. Now it's husband and wife, one man, one woman, created he them and blessed them and called their name, not his name, called their name, not his name, called their name, Adam. Adam. In the day when they were created. Starts, of course, with the, of course, with the generation of Adam, used nine times, of course, in the book of Genesis, exhibiting the same pattern that we see here in this account. A reference that what had already been done, now recording it for all's been, all of our benefits. In that accounting we find the first man, the first woman, first husband, first wife. In that order. In that order. In that order. In that order. Husband and wife. Now I did ask you in fairness, are you ready for this, didn't I? Didn't I say that? I think I said that. You want to reverse the tape and we'll find out? In that order, we find the family name given by God. Well, what was that family name, preacher? Well, what is, was it Eve? Hmm. Was it a combination, a neat combination, you know? Everybody's got to come up with all these neat things, you know? Is it a combination, a, a, a name that's kind of derived from both Adam and Eve, whatever that would be? Who, who knows? Who knows what that would be? No. God says, you too will be known as Adam. Adam. So what, this, what does this type of simple explanation say to us? We're one. Husband and wife are one. Now why does this type of thing, which I'm just talking about right now, and you're getting awful quiet. Why does this type of simple explanation offend the feminist? Hmm. Why indeed? Well, I'll offer to you just a little tidbit because it, in my mind, they're not in tune with God. And they want their own way. They want their own rules. They want their own structure. They want to make up their own world. And now we have a world making up something to say in their, a banana or a girl or whatever. Identifying. It's because these feminists and these false female preachers We'll go to every link to the man. These things simply do not matter. Well, God thinks they matter. God thinks they matter. God thinks they matter. And if you're one who loves God, you should think that it matters. At least if you're going to be on the right team. He saw fit to put it in his word. Did he not? I just read it to you. Did he not? Say amen or oh me. Now, Adam was both the personal name of the first husband and the family name of both Adam and Eve. It can be said this way, I'll offer this to you. Adam and Eve of Adam. Now before you get too high and mighty with Adam, that, that means he came from dirt. <laughs> you know, so not a whole lot to brag about there, you know. He came from dirt. One writer said, after the appointment of marriage, the husband and the wife were like one man. One person, one man. One home, one life, 
One presentation, full unity between husband and wife as one. One. See, we learned that Adam was the family name as well as Adam's name. Now, let me offer you this. And uh, I offer this because I only have one more service before I'm leaving town. So if you get mad at me, I'll see you in a couple of weeks. It's all right, you know. I doubt, after 35 years of gospel ministry experience, all right, I doubt that any woman who refuses to take a man's name after marriage will be biblically submissive to that man's leadership and truly one with him. I doubt it. All I will, I doubt it. Now, I'm not talking about keeping your maiden name on Facebook so that your old friends can find you and you know who you are. I'm not talking about that. So don't be writing me any dirty letters or talking to my officers behind my back when you walk out the door. Yeah, I hear about that too. Amen. It all eventually gets back to the preacher. What I'm talking about is the con of marriage. The con of marriage. Making a promise at the altar of God, having no intention of honoring those vows. Yeah, man, preacher. I told you I'm leaving town. <laughs> I did give you a fair warning. So let me repeat, then continue on. God ordained the home to have a functional father and mother working together as one. Not two, but one. Yet, yet, number one, a loving, authoritative structure. A loving, authoritative structure. That's number one. Number two, strong sexual distinctions. Strong sexual distinctions. From, according to the teaching of God's Word, not dressing like one another, you know. Not acting like the opposite sex. Boys raised to be effeminate are an abomination to God. You say, man, this is not how to win friends and influence people, you know. Well, if it is, if you want to do right by God. Boys raised to love their mother. Wonderful. Wonderful. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Love your mothers. Boys raised to be like their mother. Hmm. Hmm. That's a different story. Now let me be clear. God never ordained men husbands to be brutes or bullies. But. He did not ordain them to follow. Now, follow me now. He did not ordain them to follow the soft whims, cultural acuteness of pop wives either. Hmm. Remember this all your life. Soft boys make poor men. Soft boys make poor men. It may take years for the lesson to be learned, but it'll be too late, except for your crying. Some lessons, it takes a long time for them to sink in. The hippie movement and rock and roll in America brought in the effeminate presentation of men. You say, I don't know about that. I do. Do your own research. The long hair. Makeup. Low cut jeans. They call them skinny jeans, I understand. In other words, it looks like a girl's pants. Feminine colors. Now I agree with one guy who says, now when you see some NFL players, you don't know if you're supposed to whistle or one. I 
That's perfectly great for girls. That's not so great for men. Ask Absalom. <laughs> he got his. Hmm. Come a long way, baby. Again, I read in chapter 3 of Peter, he says, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they, may also, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. That means you're behaving yourself. Why? Because you fear God, which is the beginning of wisdom. Whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning, plaiting of the hair, wearing of gold, and putting on apparel. The emphasis to be on the hidden man of the heart, and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God a great price. In other words, married women ought not to certainly be dressing like single girls. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are as long as you do well, and not are afraid with any amazement. Likewise ye husbands dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Go to Genesis chapter 2, please. Genesis 2. And I want you, you know, we like to make, make more ground up, you know, <clears throat> when we get to the Lord's house. But sometimes I think we, I err by not just taking you to the Scripture so that you see it for yourself. And because it seems like some still want to completely ignore the text of the Scripture. And if you do that, you're already in trouble with God. In Genesis 2, 15. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. God gave man a job. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. You need me to read that again? It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. <clears throat> I said years ago to a man who was working for me, you need to decide if God wants you to follow your wife or God wants your wife to follow you. I can't believe, preacher, you would say something like that in the house of God. Why not? God said it first. Make up your mind. What order do you want? God's order or that which is out of order? I'm not a chauvinist, I guarantee you. I think God did a better job the second time around. Women are much better looking than men. If you haven't figured that one out, you need to see me after church. I can give you some, some helps on that. Huh. One wife told me one time, matter of fact, I've had it said to me in a wide variety of different ways through the years, 35 years plus of experience you know, doing this thing. She said, I want my husband to lead. I said, really? You don't act like it. You say you want your husband to lead, but in the mixing up of occasions that we have around here, I hear manifold examples that suggest you don't want your husband to lead, you want to lead your husband. You're the first one to offer your Almighty opinion. But yet you want your husband to lead? I think not. I think not. I beg your pardon. Amen or oh me? Well, somebody you say, you say those kind of things, dims fighting words. Why? Why? 
If that makes your blood boil, you're probably an, a, a feminist. All right, come on. Work with me, man. Hmm. Why don't you say something like that to provoke you? It's on purpose, by the way. And it's because I love you that I'm willing to provoke you and say something so strong. Seems strange to me that through the years I have been criticized. Through the years I've been criticized for advocating for strong womanhood. Did you know that? I have been criticized, me, for embracing and lifting up the example of being a strong woman. I, I'm for it. I think God's for it. Well, at the same time, I'm criticized for advocating for strong manhood. I think they have balance with one another. I think they have authority with one another. I think it's God's order. That you have a strong man. What do you want? A strong man and a weak woman or a, a strong woman and a weak man? No, I'd much rather have a strong man and a strong woman. But no, both knowing each of their roles and both getting at it knees and elbows. I have found after 35 years of ministry that many women who name the name of Jesus Christ as their Lord say they want their husbands to lead but it's only pretense. That's a, um, a very kind and tender way of saying, you're lying. On several occasions when calling, and she didn't ask me to say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. On several occasions when calling on Miss Debbie Jones to ask her a question or talk with her about something, whatever the case may, may be, uh, she has said to me, well, let me talk that over uh, with Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones. And I'll get back to you, Pastor. Very respectful, very proper. In other words, I would suggest to you that Mrs. Debbie Jones finds ways to honor her husband. She's not looking for ways to pull him down, certainly not publicly. She's looking for ways to lift him up and in doing so, and in doing so, she honors her husband. She honors herself. And most importantly, she honors her God. I say, God bless her. God bless him. And God bless their children and their grandchildren. You know, this stuff is not that complicated. It really isn't. It's made difficult because we're difficult, not because the book or God's difficult. Now it is considered cool to diminish men, diminish husbands, make them look small, make them look like idiots, even call them idiots. Make them fools. Nudge them out. Make them the joke. The joke. Undermine them at every turn. Look for ways that you can put them down, especially in public. After all, they need to be pulled down a peg or two. We laugh when it's really no laughing matter. And uh, likely we are all guilty to some extent from time to time. Nod, grunt, say something. Listen, we do this to our own destruction. Both as a nation and as Christian families. We honor our mothers, rightly so. Rightly so. Yet we dishonor our fathers. Who's ultimately behind something like that. But it's not God. It's not God honoring people. It's old Slewfoot, the devil, Lucifer. He's behind things like that. The great commandment in the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, 
says not just honor thy mother. Honor thy father and thy mother. That same order again. Look at that. He just kind of has a way of just showing up. Thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Proverbs 1, 8, 9. My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother, for they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head, and chains about thy neck. So I'm here to tell you, we ought to be embracing the biblical model of manhood. And we ought to be embracing the biblical model of fatherhood, even if it hair lips the devil. Some people say, you ought not to say things like that. That's, a, that's insensitive of you to say things like that. It seems sometimes you can't get a point across without being a little insensitive. But the ladies, those, you know, culturally, oh, you're not supposed to say things like that anymore. Well, write me a note. I'll read it in about 20 years. Well, what is the biblical model? Let's just do a little work, homework. Can we do that? Just a little bit of homework. Number one. What, what does that fatherhood look like in the scripture? Well, it's a fatherhood, really, of prestige, high honor. Now, I'm not talking about having a baby. I'm talking about being a father. Denzel Washington, by the way, and I don't know a whole lot about him, but I know some things that he has put it in their teeth. Where's your daddy? Huh? Do some Google search on that. You'll find enough what I'm talking about. Throw away any that I don't know about that I, you know. Eat the grass or leave the tin cans alone. The Bible starts there with the generations of Adam. By the way, the great purpose of Genesis 5 is not to give the age of the earth nor the human race since the time of the flood between those, but to trace the line of people who continue to honor God in the generation. In other words, honor to whom honor is due. It's not a complete genealogy record. That's for the Mormons. Now some of you will get that later. In chapter 5, Genesis 1, this is the book of the generations of Adam in the day that God created man in the likeness of God made he him. Male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam in the day they were created. Honor, the Bible says, honor thy father and thy mother. My son, hear the instruction of thy father. Forsake not the law of thy mother. According to Lifeway Research Group, Father's Day is the holiday with the single lowest average church attendance. Did you know that? Of all the holidays, Father's Day, dead last. Hmm. Hmm. Lower than Labor Day, Memorial Day, even the 4th of July. It's interesting when you consider that Mother's Day is the third highest day of attendance in the house of God. Did you know that? The C&E clubs are other Christmas and Easter, in case you didn't know. Father's Day is one of the lowest. What does that tell you? Does it say anything? I think it does. I think it does. Number two, fatherhood of the highest position. I'm talking about authority. 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 Now, I don't know that I would completely advocate for what Israel has done, that their young men have to serve three years in the military and the girls have to serve two years. But I tell you this, our children, I'm talking about the children of our nation, are not learning very much about authority. They will talk, sass, hit, violate, assault their teachers with no fear. Well, I want to tell them, don't be assaulting, assaulting our teachers around here. They'll take you out. <laughs> we'll deal with the consequences later, but they ain't going to put up with that mouth. Amen. Amen. Authority. If I take an authority that is not mine, I'm wrong. That's why if I get pulled over in plain O, wherever the case may be, it's yes, sir. Or yes, ma'am. You say, well, you're a preacher. Uh-huh. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. 
Back to Ephesians 5. Turn over there if you would. Catch me verse 22. I'm not preaching tonight, so, you know, I did get both barrels today. <laughs> this morning. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. You say, well, my husband doesn't deserve it. Does the Lord? H Hello? Hello? It's not time to pray. My husband doesn't treat me right. Well, you probably don't treat him right either. But the Bible says, Submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Hmm. For the husband is the head of the wife. Not in my house. You don't have to tell me that. It's written all over your life. Even as Christ is the head of the church and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having a wrinkle or a spot or a wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. Authority. The husband is the head of the wife. So I don't like that. Take it up with God. So when, bless her heart, you know, that's what we Southerners say. Bless her heart. So when Joyce Meyer wanted me to come to her conference, I had to kindly refuse. Authority. You don't have that authority. You don't have that authority. Don't be surprised. A lot of men don't have author that authority either. Hmm. Children, Ephesians 6, 1. Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Obey them. It seems uncanny to me that a little fellow this big will roll over people who were this big. Huh? 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 Really? Hmm. Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with promise that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. Number three, I got to hurry on. The fatherhood of power. The fatherhood of power. Strength. In the story, the back-to-back -back stories you find in Luke chapter 15, that one about the prodigal son, I want to sneak in on that text, 15, beginning of verse 17. When he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants my fathers have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. He's having a change of tune about dear old dad. And I will arise and go to my father, not my old man, my father, my father. And will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against before thee, and I am no more worthy to be called thy son. That's true. Make me one as thy, of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. And when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him. There's some lessons there. And he had compassion. And ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father... Not, hey, old man. Not, hey, dude. Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and I am no more worthy to be called thy son. That's called, by the way, humility. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. He had nothing. He was busted. Bring hither the fatted calf and kill it. He said, meat, you bet. And let us eat and be merry. The reason some people are not married, they don't eat enough meat. <laughs> For this, my son, the Bible says, this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be married. They had a great time. Now, let me just point out a couple things here. The father didn't ask anyone's opinion. 
The father didn't say, well, let me go ask the wife and see what she has to say about this. You know, she, she, she really has a, a burden. She really has a burr under her saddle what he did. He didn't go ask his wife. <sighs> he didn't go ask his wife. No. No. He didn't ask permission from anyone. He made the decision. He made that decision. You know, I could not even imagine. I know that's not correct English, but I couldn't imagine. But I couldn't even imagine. It's an emphasis or something like that. I can even imagine talking to my father the way some people talk to their fathers today. It is so far beyond anything that I would think would be proper or, or right. Nor could I ever imagine behave my, behaving myself in front of my father when I was a boy the way many small children behave themselves in front of their fathers and mothers today. With little or no correction, more often than not, it's excuse making. Excuse making. There is no fear of somebody that's ten times your size from that child. There's no power demonstrated in the home. Hmm. Proverbs 29, 15 through 17 says, The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. When the wicked are multiplied, transgression increaseth. Well, look at all the blue cities and see how that's running out. But the righteous shall see their fall. Correct thy son, and he will give thee rest. Yea, he shall give delight unto thy soul. How can something that big control something that big? Hmm. We're talking about power. Power. Somebody, why do I want my children to be afraid of their daddy? Oh, you just think they, they're never going to have to deal with the law, maybe? Never have to deal with the government? Never have to deal with the boss? Well, I don't want my children to, to be so ill-formed. What do you think is wrong with me? I've got to hurry on. Number four. Fatherhood of personality. Not position only. Relationship. Relationship. Throwing money around does not mean love or our nation would have heaps of it for everybody whether they need it or not. Well, I do this for them, I do that for them. That's not interpreted as love. A relationship is. Ephesians 6, 4, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. In the historic text of Deuteronomy chapter 6, that is a relationship of teaching and instruction. It's what you would say is more like life lessons. It is highly fluid. It's not, okay, it's time for us to study our ABCs. Of, no. It's always teaching. It's always fluid. You're always instructing. You're always helping. You're always warming the britches. Come on. Let not your heart despair for the crime. You are always engaged you want to have babies, you're on the hook to care for them. And it's not everybody else's job to care for them. It's your job. If you don't want to have children, you shouldn't have had children. But if you want to have children, it's your responsibility before God to care for them and see that they are instructed in the way of God who blessed you with them in the first place. Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 9, write those down. These words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thy house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, the fluid nature, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand, and they shall be as frontless between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and on thy gates. Now according to data collected by the Promise Keepers and Baptist Press, if a father does not go to church, even if the wife does, now listen, only one child in 50 will become a regular worshiper when they grow up. 
If a father does go regularly, regardless if the mother goes, between two-thirds or three-quarters of their children will attend church as adults. If the father attends church irregularly, irregularly between half and two-thirds of their kids will attend church with some regular, regularity as adults. If a mother does not go to church, but the father does, a minimum of two-thirds of their children will end up attending church. In contrast, if a father does not go to church, but the mother does, an average of two-thirds of their children will not attend church. Another study focused on Sunday school. Somebody says, well, we don't have Sunday school. We have small groups. Nah, another name. <sighs> it's Sunday school. Found similar results on the impact of fathers. When both parents attend Sunday Bible study, in addition to the Sunday service, 72% of their children attend Sunday school when they grow up. When only the father attends Sunday school, 55% of the children attend when grown. When only the mother attends Sunday school, 15% of the children attend Sunday school when they get grown. When neither parent attends Sunday school, only 6% of the children attend when they grow up. And you want to tell me it doesn't matter if you have a good daddy in the home? You want to suggest to me that it doesn't matter? The point of all this is dad's impact on a kid's faith and practice is huge. It's huge. Now you say, well, you know, that, that didn't go too well with uh, my feminist, you know, kind of slantings. So what? Like I said, send me a letter. I'll read it in 20 years. Now, fathers, you can't send them to be taught only. That's a mistake. You need to take them. And then you need to lead them. Then you need to teach them. And then you need to model what you're teaching. Don't be this daddy who says, do what I say, not do what I say and do what I do. You won't do what I say and do what I do. We'll learn far better from daddies who are following their example. So I'd encourage you this Father's Day, learn how to embrace the biblical model of manhood. Embrace it. I'm not saying being a caveman, you know, give me a break. Some of those guys in the NFL, they look like cavemen, sissy cavemen, but cavemen. See, they take your head off, not with my 45, they wouldn't. That's a joke. Embrace the biblical model of fatherhood. Embrace it. Embrace it. Really, embrace it. It's important. It's critically, critically important for your life. Then not only that, I encourage you to seriously consider doing your best to influence others to do the same. We've seen a lot of the results of the other side of the track and progressive thought of let's redefine these roles, let's do this and let's do that. You know, after all, I have these inclinations. I have inclinations to sin too. I try not to do those. Think you got something new going on in your life? I have it. I just, I have an urge. To, I just, well, so do I. If you run me off the road, I have the urge to slap you. But I try not to do it. Try. You're nothing new. I, I, no, I'm different. No, you're not different. You're just confused. And they say, well, I'm pretty mad right now. Yeah, I can tell that by the look on your face. But I'd ask you the question. Prove me wrong by the scripture. Not your opinion. Not what some girly professor has to say about it. Amen. You say, you're just trying to rub salt in? Yeah. Prove it. Prove it by this book. You prove it by this book, I'll buy you a bigger steak than Brother Rick had for Father's Day last night. I dare you to try. You just might find out that old-fashioned preacher is right. That's right. It's like uh, uh, Mr. Baker, you know, the scam artist years ago. 
you know, you know I'm talking about? What was his first name? Billy Baker? Jim, Jim Baker. They probably, they should have called him Billy. Billy Baker. Jim Baker. Took all people's, all, everybody's money, just built up an empire, financial empire and all for himself. Got to jail. That's where he belonged. Finally read the Bible and you know what he concluded? I read the Bible and I found out the Bible doesn't whole, say a whole, a whole lot of good things about money. <laughs> Somebody should have kneecapped you a long time ago. Put a Bible in your hand instead of a pacifier and say, read this thing, would you? Be good for you. <clears throat> Don't let anybody or anything take away manhood from you. Men and women, the message is the same. Don't let anybody do that. It's a scam. Fake news. Then, don't let anybody take away biblical fatherhood from you. That's a curse on your family, your children, your grandchildren, your great-great-grandchildren, your great-great-grandchildren, and it's a curse on your neighbors. It's a curse on the state of Texas. It's a curse on the United States of America. Don't do it. Instead, embrace it. You say, why? Just do it. Why? God said so. That ought to be good enough. That ought to be good enough. If you fear God and want to keep His commandments, that should be good enough. God said do it. That's what I'm going to do. God knows best. He created. Did He not? Did He establish the family? Did He not? No, this means yes. Then do it. Do it. Be that type of husband. Be that type of wife. Be that type of father. Be that type of mother. Let's stand. Lord of heaven, thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you, Father, when it corrects us especially. And Lord, thank you also when it comforts us and tells us, man, this is the right way. And I, I just, boy, I needed some clarification on that. There's serious, a lot of clamor and a lot of noise going on. And boy, I just need to hear it straight. I need to hear it straight. So thank you, Lord, for the straight book for people who want to walk the, 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 the narrow path, the right path. And uh, give us the strength to do that. In Jesus' name, amen. Page 601 is our hymn for invitation. Were you invited to respond and make a change in your life? Page 601, seek ye first the kingdom of God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. A couple quick announcements. Uh, number one, uh, this is an announcement. This is just something I'm telling you. All right? Don't leave the same way that you came. Every service, don't leave the same way that you came. All right. That's all the preaching I'm doing this morning. Okay. We had a great time at camp this week. That's what I told the teenagers. Don't, don't leave camp the same way that you came to camp. Visitation this, uh, this week is moved to 9 o'clock. It is Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to all you out there. We have roses for all the mothers. But we don't have anything for the dads. So <laughs> y'all just get over it. Be a man about it. Uh, <laughs> pastor is headed out of town tomorrow. Pray for him as he travels. And uh, pray for my mom as she travels with him. And... <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. This, I'm, he's my father. I'm supposed to be respecting him right now. Um, we do have started harvesting stuff from the garden, so we've got tomatoes and stuff in the kitchen, so be, uh, keep a lookout for things in there. It is missions night tonight, um, and then I think that's all I got. So, yep. Thank you for praying for us for camp this week. It was uh, good weather, good preaching, and good response from the teenagers. It was just a good time, and we didn't die. So that's, that's a plus. That's a plus. Let's go ahead and be dismissed in prayer. Lord, I thank you for the sermon this morning. It's needed, Lord, especially in this day and age. Where we need more men to stand up and lead their families. And we need um, women to respect their husbands. And also to be strong women of views as we need strong men. I agree with Pastor 100%. Lord, bless us and help us as we go. Help us to glorify you 
and to be a good influence to others, spreading your word. Thank you for Mike this morning who followed you with, with uh, Believer's Baptism. Just bless him in his life and bless each of us as we, as we uh, are ambassadors for you in this world. Bless us now. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.